The scripture today is Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. It's on page 1765 on the Pew Bibles. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm. Then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace, in addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, and with, in which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasion with all kinds of prayers and requests that with, with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Well, I must apologize to some of you. Can you hear me over there? Good? All right. Uh, because I'm having a hearing problem today. I know earlier today someone was trying to chase me down in the hallway. My ear is just blocked up, so if you call to me today and I don't answer, I'm, be, I'm not being rude. I just plan, can't hear you. So catch up with me, tap me on the shoulder, and let's have a conversation. All right? Um, the choir asked me to announce that they're looking for new recruits. Isn't that right, choir? Okay, so what should they do? Should they see Robin or Fern and you can make arrangements to come to a rehearsal and on, on, rehearsals on Wednesdays and Sundays? All right. And also, um, we've got a, a new contemporary worship band forming, and so if you feel like your musical gifts could be used in contemporary worship, Josh is the guy to see. Lift up your hand, Josh. All right, thanks. Okay. And also a plug for, um, for prayer uh, today. We'll be praying once again in the agape rooms down the passageway just before you get to the fellowship hall. So it begins 20 minutes after the service. We'll also be praying on Thursday evening this week. I encourage you to come and learn more about what it means to be a church and a, and a Christian who's inwardly strong but outwardly focused. And that's this Thursday evening at 7.30 in the, agape, in the uh, youth lounge, rather. Well, um, the first word in our text today is finally. And um, don't you love it when a preacher says, finally, or in conclusion? You can put your shoes back on, and the preacher puts his watch back on, and we're, we're ready to go. Well, finally, um, Paul writes, and it lets us know that we're coming to the end of this letter to the Ephesians. I tried to find some famous last, last words quotes that would parallel Paul's. And there's actually, if you, if you Google in quotes famous last words, uh, and you'll be taken to a site which has got a lot of people's famous last words when they're about to die. And this used to be a big deal that, that when, a, when a person of note would, would be about, would, was about to die, people would gather around and just wonder what their famous last words were. Well, I, I didn't really find anything I could use, but I did find this. Uh, this is the funniest one. Paul Claudel, the French poet of the last century, said just before he died in 1955, Doctor, do you think it could have been the sausage? Now, those are great famous last words, I think. Um, well, Paul's, Paul's last words in this letter are a bit different. Um, he says, stay strong, be prepared, be alert. W what Paul does in chapter 6, verse 10, is transition from where we were last Sunday, from applying our faith in our household relationships to applying our faith in the larger world, a world that's not going God's way. The setting in, in chapter 5 and, and, and beginning of chapter 6 was the Christian household, the, the family that we live with in our homes and also the wider church family. And so hopefully in that context, we're all on the same page to an extent and we can apply our faith uh, among people who think maybe the same way we do, about God at least. Well, what Paul's doing now is he transitions to applying our faith in the world at large a world that is not necessarily going God's way. The question is this, how do we live for Christ? 
uh, and at the same time live in a world that is not for Christ? How do we live for Christ and at the same time live in a world that is not for Christ? Well, the first step I think we must take, it's, it's like the first step in uh, Alcoholics Anonymous or NA or any of the 12-step programs is this, to admit we're powerless, to admit that we, on our own, can't do it. That's right. We can't do it. That's our first confession. You see, Christianity is not a yes, I can or a yes, you can faith where we maximize our own potential. And if you watch some of these television ministries and that's all you watch, that's the kind of diet you can get. You know, it's more like, here's how to be a success. Here's how you can do it, how you can turn your life around. Just think more positively and learn the secret and all this sort of thing. Well, Christianity is not that way. Christianity is a yes, God can faith. And before we can say yes, God can, we must admit that no, we can't do it on our own. We can't live a Christian life on our own. We can't carry out God's mission and God's purposes on our own. We can't, our own ideas and energy won't do it. Try this, try that. We, we can't do it on our own because we're naturally, and this goes back to the Garden of Eden as human beings, we're naturally weak and selfish. It's a core belief of both Christianity and Judaism that people are made in the image of God but that even as little children, we see another side to ourselves and to our little children. Um, and remember, when it's long, uh, some of you were parents and your kids were young, you know, and you started to see things in them that were bad that you didn't teach them. That comes from inside, that comes from what we call the sinful nature. So we're made in the image of God, we're beautiful, fearfully and wonderfully made, but at the same time, we're spoiled in a sense. And, and what we learn early on is the limits of our own and, and of others' spiritual and moral strength. We see it in our kids. It's hard for them to be good on their own. Kids are not all sweetness and light. There's a little bit of that inward darkness even at a young age. And ultimately, as we grow up, we discover we're spiritually unable to live right and do good on our own. However, Jesus, remember, promised that we could indeed live like he lived, we could indeed love like he loved, and we could do the kind of great things he did. So on the one hand, we're unable to do it on our own, but Jesus promised that we could do it. And so what Jesus did to give us a strength beyond our own, he gave us the gift of his presence, his spirit, so that in the power of his Holy Spirit, we could live for Christ and complete his mission to save the world. What Paul does in our text today is give us some steps we can take to help us more fully rely on God's strength. Paul paints a vivid picture when he says that taking on God's strength as our own is like putting on a suit of armor. And if you were reading this in, in a city like Ephesus or any city in the Roman world, it would have been a very familiar image to you. You would see Roman soldiers walking around your city all the time. So when he says, put your whole armor on, you'd instantly have a, a picture of, of what he was trying to say. Um, I think for us, maybe the, the parallel is the, the football player. You know, we, we, a lot of us will go out from this place, and some of us are even staying home from church to watch Sunday morning football. Uh, and, and so when you see that foot, the football player, I think, is the closest thing we have in our culture to the, to the Roman soldier, all the equipment that the football player wears to protect himself. But before Paul tells us how to put on our armor, he tells us why we must put on the armor of God. And he, he spells it out in verse 11. He says this, so we can take our stand against the devil's schemes. You might say to yourself, what, a personal devil? Isn't that an outdated belief? Isn't 